Harrison Ford, targeted by terrorists in Patriot Games. A frustrated writer finds himself prisoner of a monster in a box. And a nerd switches identities with a juvenile delinquent in Class Act. ultra-violent faction of the IRA, fighting the cause their way. Harrison Ford is an ex-CIA man fighting to defend his family in Patriot Games, one of the new movies we're going to be reviewing this week on Siskel and Ebert, and in a special segment, we will talk to some of Hollywood's top African-American directors and actors in a preview of our upcoming hour-long special. I'm Roger Ebert of the Chicago Sun-Times. And I'm Gene Siskel of the Chicago Tribune. Our first film is Patriot Games, and even though some of its drama peters out at the end, this is a mostly tension-filled thriller that, among other things, confirms Harrison Ford's status as one of our best leading men. What his characters care about, we instantly care about. In Patriot Games, Ford replaces Alec Baldwin, who starred in The Hunt for Red October. Ford is now former CIA analyst Jack Ryan, who, while on vacation in London with his wife and family, stumbles into a kidnapping attempt on a member of the royal family by a renegade group of the Irish Republican Army. Open the bloody door! Ford foils the terrorists, killing some of the ultraviolet IRA crew, and one of their surviving members, while on trial, threatens revenge. Bloody proud of yourself, aren't you? Against his will, Ford is sucked back into the CIA fold and soon finds himself under attack. His wife, played by Ann Archer, finally lets go of her natural instinct to keep her husband out of the line of fire. You get him, Jack. I don't care what you have to do. Just get him. I really like Patriot Games for its inside look at the CIA, or enough of an inside look that I thought it was an inside <laughs> look. Uh, and there's a great scene, for example, where we see a live satellite transmission of a military battle by some CIA troops. Soldiers adds dots on a monitor, a TV monitor, that is exciting and quietly chilling. That's Patriot Games at its best. It is, and uh, there was only one question I had about that scene, which is if all of those people were killed when we were watching them on satellite, how come they're still alive later on in the movie? Apparently they had the wrong camp out there in the desert, but that is never explained in the dialogue. Uh, I liked the high-tech stuff. That's what I expect from yes. Tom Clancy. What I didn't like is the fact that the movie ends with a bunch of people creeping around in a basement, yes. followed by a speedboat chase mm -hmm. in a dark and stormy night with thunder and lightning, and one of the speedboats is on fire and about to explode. And I thought a scene like that belonged, with Harrison Ford in the boat, it looked like it was a scene from Indiana Jones. Yeah. I felt that this movie betrayed its Tom Clancy origins to turn itself into kind of a routine and disappointing thriller. But only at the end, and I think that, that those, that's what I'm saying about the drama petering out, because it became routine when it was very special. But it's very special special for a long time and then there's the question of Ford uh, and I think it is a really strong performance and then a couple other things here is an Irish American character Jack mm -hmm. Ryan mm -hmm. fighting in Ireland and I think the film is sophisticated enough to give us some of the twists in his heart about what's going on no, over I didn't there. Get, there wasn't a single twist in Jack Ryan's heart. There is some sophistication about the different factions of the IRA, but Jack Ryan never thought I, as an Irishman in this no, film. No, no, no. I think where you see it is in the shot of his house, and it looks like it could be on the Irish coast. Well, I think I, that's a, okay, that's you know a real estate to. point that doesn't no, have much to do with drama. It's in the I movie. was disappointed I in the film because I thought it let Tom Clancy down. Oh, okay. Okay, next movie, and our next movie is Monster in a Box, another film in which the actor Spalding Gray, who has turned into our best monologist since Garrison Keillor, sits behind a desk and talks, and that's all he does. He talks and tells stories about his life, just like he did in an intriguing 1987 film named Swimming to Cambodia, and yet it's kind of surprising 
how interesting his talk really is as he describes what has happened to him since the previous film. And I walk in and the head guy gives me, well, the actually the only drug left in Hollywood, a can of Diet Coke. And then uh, he leans into me and says, uh, uh, thank you very much, Spalding, for coming and taking time from your busy schedule uh, to come in and talk with us. We'd like to begin by telling you that we all hope you're not one of those artists that's afraid to make money. Uh, no, uh, I, I, I don't think so. He was also called on to join a delegation to Russia where he was surprised to find no, no vodka. vodka. And no one would be talking about the absence of it. You never hear anyone say, when will the vodka come again? Or, do you remember the vodka? No, nothing. And yet they were passionate. They were as passionate as if they were drunk. I mean, I had always thought that the, the Russians were passionate because of the vodka. It's not true. It's genetic. I'm passionate because of the vodka, and I wanted it. You know what's a funny thing about this movie? Monster in a Box reminded me of how much I enjoyed swimming to Cambodia, and also how much I admired the original all-talking movie, My Dinner with Andre. All you see is a guy talking, yet his ideas are so engaging and his style is so bright that you start forming images in your mind that are more vivid than a lot of the things that we ordinarily see on the screen these days. You know, Roger, I think I like the attempt here and the way you're talking about the film more than I like the specific things that he talked about. Mm -hmm. um, swimming to Cambodia, I felt a real passion and a real search and the same kind of emotional search mm -hmm. for some meaning in life in the way I thought it with my dinner with Andre. Here, I thought it was like a little travel log. Uh, it's probably been, what, about four weeks since we've seen this picture, three, four weeks mm -hmm. since we've seen the picture. I don't recall the specific things that he's talking about. As you said them to me, yes, I recall that, the topics, but I don't recall the passion. So I admire the, I admire the form tremendously. Yeah. Uh, this execution wasn't Well, I greatest. think what he's up against is the fact that his first movie could draw on his entire previous life, yes. and this movie could only draw on the last five years. Yet, on the other hand, I did find it interesting because here's a guy who really talked his way into the inner circle. He has been working as an actor a lot more mm -hmm. since he did that stage show that became the first movie. And so he has gone on a kind of a career journey that's interesting. I think it's a good film. Uh, I saw him uh, in the play that he talks about, yeah. uh, Our Town, where he was the, uh, the narrator. Um, and uh, He got the worst, he says he got the worst reviews in town. Was he that bad? He wasn't that bad. The play was wonderful. But more than that, I didn't think his telling of it was that compelling. Mm -hmm. The form, I, I'd like to see him encourage, and maybe he will, more people to do this sort of thing. Okay, coming up next, Kid and Play, the stars of House Party, are back in a new comedy called Class Act. First of all, you gotta dress right. Style is more than just a state of mind, my brother. Blade! <laughs> what a surprise. Nice crib. Uh, 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 Mom, Dad, uh, this is my friend Blade. Blade? That's your name? Dad, is that yours? That's a scene from Class Act, a sometimes funny, mostly silly adolescent comedy starring Kid and Play, the rappers and actors who star in the House Party movies, both of them. And Class Act turns out to be sort of a double fish-out-of-water story with Kid playing a brainy guy and Play as a brutal street character. Their high school files are switched, so the brain is sent to a class full of toughs and the brute is sent to a class full of geniuses. And that leads to scenes like this, where the nerdy smart guy gets a come on from a sexy party girl. She thinks he's a stud. And um, Sherelle told LaWanda, who told Devon, who told Alisa, who told me that uh, you know how to do things that she never <laughs> drinked about to Is that true? Eventually, the tough guy figures out what's gone wrong as he confronts the brain with a less than polite request. No, don't be me. You be you for me. You ace all my classes a semester, and I'll let you live. Eventually, they change haircuts and join in a rap song at an anti-drug rally. And if the gang ain't dead, quit it. Just forget it. I'm moving on. Because I'm too strong. I know right from wrong. I laughed at Class Act enough to marginally recommend it as light entertainment, but with a couple of strong reservations. The treatment of the women in the film is really lame, using the girls in the picture solely as comic instruments in terms of whether or not they're going to have sex with the boys. I really wish the female characters had been written stronger in Class Act, and there's one other thing. A couple of concerned parents of the smart guy are kind of really crudely treated and made total fun of when some of their values aren't so bad. Yeah, you know, I can't recommend this film. I feel that the idea behind it is a really strong one. The fact that, that how society perceives you has a lot to do with what you achieve and how you think of yourself. 
and that could have been used in a hundred different ways to make a fascinating film, but instead what we have here is a really goofy teenage comedy, and I agree with you that the women in the film yes. are completely badly treated. There's another problem, too, and that's the relationship between skin tone and class in this film. It's absolutely correlated from top to bottom that the smarter you are, the lighter skinned you are, right down to the classroom animal who is very dark skinned. There isn't a single violation of that coding in this film, the only, including the girlfriends. Okay, the, the only thing that could be said, and I don't know, that doesn't mean it's necessarily bad. It's, no, mis, no accidents are made in casting. Um, well, I don't know about that. No, I'm not saying no. it's bad. I'm saying it's typecasting. Coming up next, Zentropa, as a young American, goes to work in post-war Germany. I believe my taking on a job as a civilian here is a small contribution to making the world a better place. images fill the screen in glorious black and white and an occasional flash of color in Zentropa, a strange new film by a Danish director about the earliest days of post-war Germany. In the movie, Jean-Marc Barr plays a young American who goes to Germany looking for work and gets a job as a conductor on a Pullman car. But this is no ordinary train. On board, it would appear, are all of the weary, corrupt, and seductive types left over by the cynicism of World War II. You've chosen unusual time to come to Germany. An American in a civilian job is a rare sight these days. Please excuse my curiosity, but what are you doing here? Zentropa, directed by Lars von Trier, is a great-looking movie with its play between color and black and white and its use of special effects to give us a sometimes, frankly, artificial landscape of cold and destruction. But what is this movie about? It's more about a mood than about a plot. It's more about moments than about how things turn out. And it's about moral exhaustion after a war and about intrigues that seem to be carried on for their own sake and about the innocence of the American and the world weariness of Europe. All of that is great to look at and think about, but I would have liked it more if style didn't always seem more important than substance in this film. Except that, Roger, I think that the issues that you just rattled off were obviously communicated. You got them, and I thought that they were done very well. Mm -hmm. And I was tension-filled in, in interest from the moment the film starts with its train. Mm -hmm. And you know, I didn't know what the movie was gonna be about. I had just sort of seen that title. Yeah. And when I saw the train, I said, this is a train that could have carried people to their death. And those mm -hmm. tracks and back did. And so now we're seeing that train carry people through their life. What is gonna happen post-war Germany? What happens in the face of evil? How do people react? And I think we see a complete kaleidoscope of the way people react. Some people lose their uh, moral compass. Uh, some people get it back. Some people try to accommodate. Every facet, I thought this was a terrific film, and I highly, highly recommend it, and I'm surprised you don't. Well, I, d I would give it a marginal thumb up, but what I'm trying to say is that it's a very beautiful film to look at, but I think that most of the ideas that you say I came up with and that you have elaborated are ideas that we have come up with and we have elaborated. They're suggested by the mood of the film, but they're not really there. Coming up next, four major black talents talk about the new reality for black performers in Hollywood. This weekend and next on the station you're now watching, Roger and I will have our annual hour-long summer special. This year we're going to be talking with four major movie talents about the new black cinema, which we both think is alive and kicking the cobwebs out of more mindless mainstream Hollywood movies. Roger went to the Cannes Film Festival recently to talk with Whoopi Goldberg and Spike Lee. I went to California to talk with Wesley Snipes and director John Singleton. They had a lot of interesting things to say, all of which we couldn't squeeze into one hour. So here are some outtakes from the special, beginning with Wesley Snipes talking about how the recent success of black filmmakers can lead to some very sloppy pieces of movie making as corporate Hollywood tries to cash in on a trend. Anybody who comes down the shoot with a script, black, talking about issues from the black community on the heels and the tailwind of the success of a new Jack, the studios go, yes, maybe this is the one. It's 50 grand here, 100 grand here. Irregardless, irregardless of how trivial, how racist, how, how stupid the project is. You can have mediocre project and a mediocre result. 
that in of itself translates into small box office receipts because the people who are going to go see the movies, especially the black folk, we're going to be able to say, hey, that's garbage. I'm not going to go see that piece of crap, even if it is made by black folk. Then the studio goes, well, you know, black films ain't making no money no more, so why are we going to make them? So your message is to executives, have some taste. Don't fund every black project that comes along. Or is it Absolutely. To... Apply the same standards you would to a white project to a black project. Do you think that uh, a movie like Malcolm X will influence whether a certain budget can be exceeded in terms of uh, films like this? Yes, I think that after Malcolm X, with the success this film is going to have, which I anticipate, the glass ceiling that is, that is on black cinema will be raised. And you have to leave... Oh, every, every time I say this, I always say, leave Eddie Murphy out of this. And Hollywood is my ideal is that Eddie's, Eddie Murphy is not perceived as black. Mm -hmm. The same way Michael Jackson is not perceived as black in the music industry. I mean, I think there's this perception that once if you have a black artist that appeals to everybody, they're no longer black anymore. I don't know, I don't know what, that, what that makes them, but they're not black anymore. You know, there are people who have said about your career that uh, sometimes it wasn't always wise for you to go for non-traditional casting choices I you know, know. because you've traditionally looked for roles that didn't require a black woman no and and I'm, I'm an actor that's my job that's what I'm supposed to do Shakespeare started out with all men dressed as women doing his plays from city to city that's the idea you are not supposed to just be I mean the player is a great example we don't talk about black or white when V.I. Wachowski what is it called yeah that, Orzowski. Yes, yeah. everybody talked about what a great strong woman's part that was, or when when uh, uh, Sigourney did Aliens, they talked about how great it was to see a, a strong woman. I did Fatal Beauty, and everybody said, what a ridiculous thing for there are no women cops like that. Why are you blowing up buildings? How are uh, actors treated, black actors treated in the movies today? You know, we went through the... Like, <laughs> really? <laughs> They're treated like nothing. No matter how talented they are, they can be like... They do not get paid as well. They do not get res respected as well. Larry Fishburne, by virtue of his own talent as an actor, he's just nominated for a Tony Award, right? right for Two Trains Running, by by just his make sure it's his talent, not by anything else. Whatever it has has worked in this business for 20 years, right? But you, if he, you know, if he was a white guy, man, you know, he'd be like, he'd be up there with Bobby De Niro, you know. What kind of salary difference is it? If a, if a black actor is of a certain caliber, right, and he gets $100,000 for a film, it's a safe bet to believe that a white actor of the same caliber and the same talent will get 50000 or or 100000 more than that. Okay. I'd put my life on I can look at a line budget of, 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 like, five films, and we could probably find the disparities like that. Some powerful ideas there. Just for the record, Larry Fishburne, the actor from Boys in the Hood that John Singleton was talking about, did win the Tony Award for his performance in August Wilson's Two Trains Running. If you enjoyed what you just saw, I think you're going to enjoy more frank talk on the upcoming special during the next two weekends on these Siskel and Ebert stations. Never thought about them that, quite that way. <laughs> Siskel and Ebert stations. Well put. <laughs> Coming up next, our video pick of the week from a very special new collection of important movies on videotape. Siskel and Ebert's Video Pick of the Week, brought to you this week by Orville Redenbacher Popcorn. Do one thing and do it better than anyone. One of the major American distributors of foreign films over the past 30 years has been New Yorker Films, which brought us many of the major works of directors like Fassbender, Herzog, Bertolucci, and Godard. And now New Yorkers releasing many of their best films that are in their catalog on home video. And the good news is these are crystal clear prints with subtitles that are easy to read. One of my all-time favorites is in the series. It's called Equinox Flower by the great Japanese master Yasujiro Ozu, one of the greatest directors of all time, whose calm style runs very deep, as in this story about a father who wants to arrange his daughter's marriage and a daughter who wants to make up her own mind. <laughs> It's hard to see good foreign films in theaters these days because art houses seem to thrive only in the big cities, so a selection of good films like these from New Yorker is a chance to have your own foreign film series at home on video. 
Now let's take another look at the movies we reviewed on this show. A split decision on Patriot Games. Gene really liked the inside CIA stuff and Harrison Ford, and so did I, but I thought it degenerated into a routine thriller. Another disagreement on Monster in a Box, Balding Gray's autobiographical monologue. Gene thought the material was thin. I found his talk fascinating. Another split decision on Class Act. Gene thought it was silly enough to recommend. I thought it was too silly to recommend. We both vote thumbs up on Zentropa, a movie about the sick soul of post-war Germany. So, uh, Zentro which one? Zentropa. Zentropa, I think, Roger, um, is a candidate, an early candidate for one of my best films of the year. I liked it that much. And I think that, again, uh, Harrison Ford probably underrated, not by Hollywood, but I think maybe by the public. Uh, and he's really strong, I think, in Patriot Games. Okay, that's it for this week. Next week, we'll be back with Michael Keaton trying to save Gotham City from Danny DeVito's Penguin and Michelle Pfeiffer's Catwoman in Batman Returns. And also House Sitter with Steve Martin, driven mad by Goldie Hawn, who checks in and won't check out. That's next week, and until then, the balcony is closed. Presenting now by Armatron, stunning fashion-forward designs that combine the very latest upscale styling with the superb quality long associated with Armatron. rice a -roni, any day of the week, the flavor can't be beat. rice a -roni, the San Francisco treat. Shower yourself with a new sensation, new refreshing shield. Experience its unique skin-vigorating formula and feel the blast of pure refreshment. New craft-free peppercorn ranch, so good it's anything but the same old grind. If it tastes too good to be fat-free, it's craft-free. Free.